Hello lovers. Needless to say, the beginning of March has not gone entirely to plan. And although we are not about judgement on this channel, we are probably about explanations. Chiefly, how did we get into this situation? And why didn't you stop me? We're supposed to be friends! and welcome back to a very chill tea catch up and oh dear I started mood reading March. No wait I mean uh, a currently reading update. Yeah I mean as a reader occasionally you have to go with the flow and sometimes that means that you're up a very brown creek with no paddling instruments. But before we get into the cosy little catch up, let me first introduce you to today's sponsors, Anna Luisa. You guys know that I am an Anna Luisa champion. I absolutely love their pieces. I think they're timeless and so stylish and just so easy to accessorize any outfit with. We've talked a lot on this channel about invisible illnesses and in particular about the fatigue that comes with them. And although I may appear upbeat and happy today, I am very, very tired. And one of the things that just perks me up every single time is adding an Ana Luisa piece to one of my outfits. These pieces just instantly elevate any outfit to make you look so polished, so finished, even on days where it has literally been a struggle to get out of bed. Today I'm wearing their beautiful Lev necklace which is this stunning puffed heart and when I say today I actually mean for the last two weeks because I am obsessed with it and I don't want to take it off. So for the month of March, in honour of Mother's Day, if you would like to get 20% off site-wide on Anna Luisa, you can follow the link in my description to treat yourself or your chosen mama in your life because mothers are not always what? Biological. So on the note of being incredibly tired, let's have a little just you and me catch up before we drop into the books. March has been extremely busy so far. Way busier than I thought that it was going to be. So right at the beginning of March I helped my lovely friends Jill and Jean to move in to their stunning new flat and we did a lot of painting and a lot of like running around and organising stuff and it was the most Fun. I am so proud of them and everything that they have achieved in such a short time. I take a lot of joy from being the mum friend so it was really nice to be able to offer experience and advice when it came to decorating and painting and hanging things on walls. And then on the 4th, right in the middle of all of this, it was my birthday. Here I am wearing the ceremonial birthday hat from my household. Looking incredibly tired because guys though I have lived with this for a number of years now I am still not an expert at this chronic illness life and I often do not account for the physical slump that follows like a vast amount of activity and energy I still kind of forget that it's gonna cost me something afterwards so while my birthday was amazing and we went out and had lovely food I I did, I did feel a little bit like a scum bucket. I looked like a thumb and I was moving like a slug. And then I got ill. Yep, you can probably still hear it in my voice. I'm still really croaky. But I somehow managed to catch the one chest infection that was just wandering around out there all on its own with no friends. But because all of this happened right at the start of March and I ended up with like the resulting brain fog from it, I didn't film a TBR. And I thought to myself, this could go one of two ways. Either I can choose books from the prompt list that I had made or I could save that amazing fun concept for April and I could just give myself the birthday gift of mood reading through March. And this was a prime example of who let me be in charge. Especially in the throes of chronic illness exhaustion, who let Leanne make the decision to mood read? And don't get me wrong, it has resulted in so many books being read, but it has also resulted in me being in the middle of, shall I count, shall I just count? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten books. 
in the middle of the book. Thought it was only eight, but I forgot my Kindle and the, the thing that I'm reading out loud to Harry. Well, that's a thing that has happened to me. But hopefully it'll be one of those things where by the end of the month it'll just be like boom 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 and then I'll be like oh look at how many things I read all on my lonesome I don't tell the internet about it. Yeah you can you can vote on the likelihood of that down below but be kind <laughs> please please. Okay so here's the situation and let's let's just take it from the top shall we? The first book which I think I'm about me a quarter of the way through is Days of Blood and Starlight by Lainey Taylor which is book two in the Daughter of Smoke and Bone trilogy which I started the eh, January? No it was February because in February the spinny wheel was very nice to me. I remember now January and February have kind of weirdly bled together for me in an odd way. Anyway I reread Daughter of Smoke and Bone and it was just as glorious as I remembered it to be. I was completely in love with it, so much so that I made Harry listen to the audiobook. If you have never read this series, Daughter of Smoke and Bone is about Caru. She is an art student who lives in Prague and she is a little bit unusual. She doesn't really have any family to speak of and her friends see her as somebody they love but a bit of an enigma. Caru has, for her entire life, been drawing a series of what look like comics featuring chimeras, animals slash humans who have all different sort of makeups, all different animal parts, but who have very consistent storylines. And her friends are hooked on these stories. They want to know more about them. But what they don't realise is that these stories are real and that Caro spends half of her life beyond a magical door in a different world living with these chimeras who brought her up and then one day the doors to that other world start to close and Caro has to decide if they are closing which side she wants to end up on. The next one that I have is In the Seeing Hands of Others by Nat Ogle. This one I bought completely blind. I was with the lovely Jean and Ashley at the end of February, I think, and we did, you know, a lot of wandering, which inevitably ended up in Blackwells in Edinburgh, which seems to be our normal thing. And I saw this one. It is not often that I see a thriller that I have never heard of before, that I've never had pitched to me in any way. And so I spotted this and I was like, Oh, it's one of those thrillers that although it's a thriller, it's been blurred by like lots of different people from lots of different genres, which made me go, hmm. And then I discovered that it's mixed media. It is told in a lot of emails and interviews and police reports. There are little bits and pieces in here that are blacked out. My bookmark fell out, that's unacceptable. I think I was there. Now, I obviously picked this up quite early in March because I bought it at the end of February and it was like burning a hole in my TBR cart. But this one has a lot, and I mean a lot, of chat about hospitals and illness because the main character is a nurse who works on a dialysis ward which means that she works with a lot of patients who are both genuinely going to be fine and are also end of life and so there is a lot especially right at the beginning of quite triggery stuff in here and although I really love the way that it is written I was not finding that my brain was okay with hearing about that stuff just then. So I'm going to read you the blurb of this one because I think that it's very concise and I think that it is also very good at giving you the mood of the entire thing. It says you are about to enter a novel formed of documents and evidence. Here is the blog of a nurse on a dialysis ward attempting to live in the aftermath of bringing a rape trial to court in which the defendant was exonerated. Here are the transcripts of the police interviews with her and the accused, the emails and texts between them submitted for trial, his journal, his conversations on 4chan, his drama scripts, him, him, him. How will the nurse, Karina, ever get him out of her head and then it goes on to say that it is a legal drama so it doesn't call itself a thriller but that's definitely where I would place it on the shelves. Like Days of Blood and Starlight I am about to pick this one back up again. I think I'm going to read these simultaneously because although this one's got a lot of like really dark stuff happening and it now being the second book in an urban fantasy series 
is still a lot like coming home to a world that I feel really cosy in so I think it will be a nice like juxtaposition to this one which in fairness is very quick to read because the format really lends itself to flipping through it quickly so that's where I am with that one next up I have a book that I have borrowed from a friend and I always love being able to say that it just feels super special so when I was helping Jill and Jean move into their new flat we were unpacking boxes and boxes and boxes of books as you can imagine when a bookworm moves in with a booktuber there there was a library explosion going on and in the middle of it all Jill just turns to me and shoves this book into my hand and she's like you will love this you should read this this is entirely your thing and then she gave me like a whip crack synopsis in three seconds and it was great I was instantly sold and she was like take it away read it bring it back so this one is The Lady from the Black Lagoon by Mallory O'Meara and it is about the woman who actually created the very famous creature from the Black Lagoon which is you know a famous horror monster but who was not credited for any of her work. Millicent Patrick was literally a pioneer she came up with so many concepts her past was very shady and hard to put your finger on and she was pretty hard to find but the author decided that she was going to delve into history and try and find the trail that this woman blazed through these films and was never given proper credit for. I have literally only just started this one. This is my non-fiction book that I have on the go. I try to always have a non-fiction book going on in the background even if you don't see it picked in my TBR. I usually do have it and I love the style of this one so far. It is very conversational. I feel like quite a lot of the time when I read biographies it's like the author has found all of this information and is determined to cram all of it in and you're going to know all of the minutia that you maybe don't really need but this definitely doesn't feel like that. I feel like I'm not just getting broad strokes but I'm getting little anecdotes as well and it's just, it's great. It's really great. So thank you Jelly Pops for lending me this one. I promise I will bring it back to you in a timely manner. Next up we have got my Kindle or my device of shame and I ended up reading this in a very sort of weird and roundabout way. I was doing Patreon sprints again with the lovely Jean and I was saying that I wasn't sure which book I was going to pick up and one of them that I had recently purchased was A Master of Gin and Jean was like oh my god there is a short story which was written before this book which sort of introduced the characters like a tour short story. I picked up the short story and so far it's really good. It is steampunk urban fantasy set in Cairo in like the late Victorian era. The main character is an Egyptian woman who absolutely kicks ass. Women have only just recently been allowed to join the, I think they call it the ministry, who look after sort of supernatural events and her male colleagues are not very coping with this and at the very beginning of the story obviously a genie dies and she has to try and work out how this has happened and why this has happened and it's very intriguing so far so this one's probably going to be finished today but I felt like I had to tell you about it for you know the purposes of accountability. Okay next up is one that I am nearly finished it's a very very short one in all fairness and it is Antigone by Holly McNish. If you have never heard of Antigone before it is a Greek. it is a Greek for it is a Greek it is a Greek <laughs> it is a Greek tragedy why was that so hard to say a Greek tragedy by Sophocles I first read it in university and I absolutely fell in love with it cannot get enough of it I have read so many versions of Antigone this is just the latest that I have added to my pile and I have read another one this month to mm, do I have a problem maybe so the play is about the character of Antigone who is one of the daughters of Oedipus and at the beginning of the play Antigone and her sister Ismene are told that both of her brothers who had gone to war for the throne of Thebes have been slain they have been both killed in the battle. With no other heirs her uncle Creon is then crowned the king but Creon sided with one of her brothers and not the other. So one of her brothers is given a full military funeral and her other brother has been 
laid outside of the city boundaries, outside of the walls of the city, and is being guarded by military so that his body stays there and essentially rots. Antigone cannot bear this to happen, she cannot stand for this to happen, and so she stands up to her uncle and defies him to give her brother burial rights and the rest of the play is about what happens after that. There's obviously a lot of themes to unpick in this and a lot of things that Antigone does when it is rewritten which comments on modern life which is exactly what Holly McNish has done with this. It's stunning. I have absolutely loved reading it and again I'll talk about it more in my wrap up but I'm going to finish this one hopefully today. Speaking of Greek and Roman times I'm about to completely expose myself here. All of my ancient texts and my retellings of Greek and Roman myths and all of my non-fiction books about ancient times all live on like two pretty chunky shells at the top of my stairs and quite a lot of the time <laughs> <laughs> if Harry is having a shower, Harry will leave the door open and I will play the first sentence game and I will randomly pick a book off of these shelves and just perch there at the top of the stairs and read them a couple of pages of whatever book. Sometimes this means that Harry will then go on and pick one of those books up on audiobook and other times it means that things like this happen where I end up reading them an entire book because the start of it has been so good. I think I've talked about this series of books before on my channel as well but this is the 24 hours in ancient Rome. There is an ancient Greece, ancient China and ancient Egypt version of these all by different authors. So the book contents lists an actual 24 hour period in the day of ancient Rome when it would have been like in the city of ancient Rome and each hour we follow a different person. So at the beginning of this one we start on hour six of night for Rome which for them started as soon as the sun goes down but for us we're picking up at zero to 100 hours on a 24 hour clock. And so the first chapter is entirely about this watchman but it also comes from the point of view of a watchman. It assumes his story so you kind of get like a fictional character or a character that has been lifted from historical record. It's that kind of like chatty version of a non-fiction book about history which is what I really really love. This has been fun to just read like a chapter or two of a night. We've been really really enjoying that and again we'll finish this one this month and we might even go on and read one of the other ones together because Harry's very into this right now. Now the next one is one that I have literally only just picked up. I was a little bit behind because of everything that I've talked about in getting my Patreon book club up and running this month so we chose our text a little bit late and as a result I'm only just picking it up now. So for the March to April pick my book club picked another adult fantasy and so to mix up the choices that I put in this time we're all queer adult fantasy. So unlike uh, January's to February's book Jade City which <coughs> I DNF'd <coughs> more on that later. This one is like high fantasy but set mostly in a city and it primarily looks at some con men and a masquerade. This is The Mask of Mirrors by M.A. Carrick. Now M.A. Carrick is actually a writing team. I can't remember what one half of the team is called because I have not read any of their books. But the other half of the team is Marie Brennan who as you will all know from this channel is the author of the Memoirs of Lady Trent series which if you are into fantasy and you are into dragons you absolutely need to read. Fortune favours the bold, magic favours the liars. Wren is a con artist who has come to the sparkling city of Nadizra with one goal to trick her way into a noble house securing her fortune and her sister's future. But her masquerade is just one of many and as corrupt nightmare magic begins to weave its way through the city of dreams, the poisonous feuds of its nobility and the shadowy dangers of its impoverished underbelly become tangled with Wren at their heart. So apparently this is the start of a trilogy called the Rook and Rose trilogy and literally everything that I have seen about it online are just like this is hella queer so I am hella here for it. Next up I think I have 
mentioned this one before as well somewhere on the channel but this is Quarantine Comics by Rachel Smith and essentially this is a collection of comics which Rachel published on Instagram throughout the pandemic because she was struggling and she needed to get it out somewhere. It is very funny and very heartwarming and also very sad in a few places. I love the quote on the front which says, like the hug from a friend you didn't know you needed. Uh, because I think that is accurate. That is entirely accurate of what this is. There is also a lot of mental health representation in here because we have Barky and Friendly. So Barky is the imaginary dog that Rachel talks to throughout the entire comic who basically represents her depression. And then we've got Friendly who <laughs> represents Rachel's common sense and optimism. Tells Rachel good and useful things. Yay, Friendly! This could have been a very quick read. I could have just rushed through it reading one comic after the other but I decided to take it a little more slowly and to just dip in and out of it when I needed like a palette cleanser and it has just been really really nice. Okay so eight down and two to go. The second from last book that I am reading is Wake Siren Ovid Resun by Nina McLaughlin. So essentially this is a retelling of Ovid's metamorphosis entirely from the female perspectives who were resoundingly done dirty. Of course Metamorphosis is all about transformation and so Nina McLaughlin has decided to take these tales of transformation and just tweak them just a little bit. And that is where I admit I am having an issue with this one because I feel like the stories have not been changed quite enough and I think this is a pit that a lot of people who do retellings of especially Greek myths fall into and in that they take the original storyline and stick really really closely to it but also offer commentary on it as they go but because of that it doesn't really feel like I'm reading anything new because I think anybody who is into Greek myth and any kind of feminism at all is already kind of in their mind knowing what some of these female characters are going through and what they must be feeling and has kind of thought about that themselves. And so although the writing is beautiful, the writing is stunning and some of the ways that these short stories are told is very experimental like on the page some of them are in verse some of them are in script some of them are only dialogue and there's no description some of them there's no dialogue at all despite all of that I still don't really feel like I'm getting anything new from this so I'm kind of in two minds about whether I carry on with it which is really sad because I was really really excited for it and again the writing is it's the thing that's just keeping me there and keeping me going back so I don't know you will know at the end of the month whether I have carried on with this one or not but currently Anne is in two minds about it. And then finally, finally, I allowed myself another reread this month. I said that like I was doing a really illicit thing, which I think is dumb because I am all for rereading. And in fact, my only real goals this year was to do more rereading. But I kind of feel like I'm in a place where rereading feels a little bit guilty making. Rereading right now feels a little bit like I'm cheating on all of the new things that like I got for Christmas and my birthday. So I chose to go and reread Truly Devious by Maureen Johnson. This is partly my wonderful friend Kirsty's fault. I will link Kirsty's Instagram down below. She does amazing amazing reader advisories she is a librarian it is her top skill in life Kirsty has been asking me when are you going to read the most recent one in this series because i need to know your opinions on it so i was like oh no i will have to reread the series to to read the fourth book oh what a shame and so here i am so truly devious is about stevie bell she is a true crime fanatic podcasts, Netflix documentaries, you name it, she absolutely loves it. She has aspirations of becoming an FBI investigator herself. Stevie has found out about the mysterious Ellingham Academy because of a very famous kidnap and murder that happened there years and years ago. Ellingham is an exclusive academy which is free 
if you are admitted you do not need a scholarship and it allows you to explore learning in any way that you like. It's full of riddles, hidden passageways, entire libraries devoted to some very, very weird subjects. And one day Stevie just applied by saying she had aspirations of standing over a body and they were like, you know what, you're the kind of kid that we want and she got in. She is possibly the funniest character that I have ever read ever. I absolutely love Maureen Johnson's writing and that is because Maureen Johnson is a lover of Agatha Christie and Golden Age Crime, Dorothy L. Sayers and Agatha Christie are like her absolute, you know, writing gods and that very much comes through in this with a lot of modern sass. So if you've been sleeping on this series, I suggest that you pick it up because you are not going to be disappointed and neither am I. I'm absolutely ripping through this. I'm probably, I'm probably going to finish it today. I'm like two thirds in it. I'm, I'm probably going to finish it today and then start the next one. Sorry, not sorry. And that was my catch up. That was all of the stuff that was going on for me. I love doing these chill, chatty catch up videos with a bit of life in there and a bit of my chaotic reading. So I hope that you guys have also enjoyed it because when we get to April, we, we are going back to a structured TBR. I really missed you guys and I hope that you have missed me. Before I go, remember that if you would like to get 20% off for the month of March at Anna Luisa to celebrate your chosen mums in your life or you know just for yourself because you're worth it you can click my link down in the description below for that 20% off. If you have enjoyed this video please consider hitting that thumbs up because it helps me to reach other bookworms like you and if you are new here then subscribe for more bookish shenanigans. Oh and if you would like to read some queer fantasy remember to check out my Patreon because apparently that's what we're going to be doing for the next two months. I will speak to all of you guys really soon. Bye! And I don't have to put any of these away, I just have to stick them back on my nightstand because I'm still reading them all. Ha <laughs> ha!